recording too. So hello everybody and hello Mona and Mary. <laughs> welcome to welcome to Virtual Warwicks. <laughs> and on release day, Mona of all's well. We're so excited for you. Yay. <laughs> we're so, I mean, ah. Oh. Just, I, I'm so excited for this conversation. I'm so happy for you, Mona. This is going to be so much fun. I'm going to fill a little bit of time just talking about Warwick's for a minute, just to give Facebook a chance to let everybody know that we're here. So just a little bit about Warwick's. Uh, Mona and Mary are coming to us from the East Coast. Warwick's is located in San Diego, La Jolla, little town above San Diego in California. So we have both the coast covered. Hopefully we have some people joining us from in between too. Uh, today's conversation between Mona and Mary is going to be for about 35, 45 ish minutes, something like that. I'm going to be putting into the comment section of Facebook. If you're watching this on YouTube later, sorry that we're not live on YouTube um, when you're watching this, but on Facebook, if you're watching us, um, I'm going to be putting into that section how you can order Mona's book from us. I just say any way there is to get a book, you can get it from Warwick's, we can ship it to you. But if you're in the San Diego, La Jolla area, um, and you want to click pick up in store, we'd love to see you in the store. There's nothing better than browsing Mona's other books, Mary's books, everybody else's books. There's lots of great stuff to get at Warwick's. Um, so like I said, they're going to talk for about 35, 40 minutes. In that comment section, you'll also be able to pop in some questions. So go ahead and put those in and I will feed those to Mary and Mona at about that 30, 35 minute mark. So don't be shy. And we always love good questions. No questions or bad questions. I might filter some, but you never know. <laughs> but we'll get to as many as we can. So with that, I think I've given Facebook enough time to let everybody know that we're here. So let me introduce these two wonderful women. So Mona Awad is the author of the critically acclaimed Bunny, what, that book, <laughs> and 13 Ways of Looking at a Fat Girl, named a best book of 2019 by Time, Vogue, and the New York Public Library, a finalist for the New England Book Award, and currently in development with an AMC series written by Megan Mostyn Brown. Yay. And we're having, just to let people know too, we're having a little bit of an echo issue with Mary's, uh, with what's going on here. So Mary's muted for a little bit. And so we just got a little bit of technical issues, but we'll, we'll get through those. Um, so back to Mona. She was published, um, she has published work in the New York Times mag Magazine, Time, Vice, Electric Literature, McSweeney's, and elsewhere. She begins teaching fiction fall 2020 in the MFA program at Syracuse. So is that this past year you started in the fall? Fantastic. And she currently lives in Boston. So I've, I've held this up a number of times. I'm going to keep holding it up. She's, we're going to talk today about all's well, but I'm sure there'll be other things that we'll be talking about too. Joining her today is Mary Carr. Mary's best-selling The Art of Memoir followed her three award-winning best-selling books, The Liars Club, Cherry, and Lit, which kick-started the autobiographical revolution. A Guggenheim Fellow in Poetry, Mary's five collections include recently Tropic of Squalor and Sinner's Welcome. Other awards include the Whiting Writers Award, Penn's Martha Albrand Award, Ratcliffe's Budding Fellowship. She is also a two-time finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Her graduation speech, Now Go Out There, lit up the Twitter, Twitter sphere. I love that. She is the Peck Professor of Literature at Syracuse University, and her next memoir, Just You Wait, deals with aging. Ladies, have a great conversation. I will see you in about a half hour or so. Or so. Wow, Mona, it is so great to join you here. I loved this book. I, for those of you, I, I have to make a full disclosure. Mona just joined us uh, at the MFA program at Syracuse. But before she did, I was a huge fan of 13 Ways of Looking and of Bunny. And I feel like your voice, Mona, you've always had this amazing voice and you've also had this talent for the magical. Um, which is like in the great books like by Garcia Marquez or some of Alana Ferrante um, or Toni Morrison where the magical is so grounded in psychological reality. Um, Mona's also responsible for all the books on Jung I've bought in the past year. <laughs> she, taught a, she taught a class on, on fairy tales if you, I'm assuming because the book just came out, many of you have not read it, 
but it 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 follows the travails and triumphs and horrors of uh, one Miranda Fitch, who is uh, a, a literally fallen actress who, uh, from tumbling off the stage, has this chronic pain, this just agonizing pain that no one believes. And um, she's going to produce this great play, All's Well, which is one of Shakespeare's most, would you call it one of the most troubled plays? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, and I just, I, you have to start by reading some from it, just so people hear who she is and the kind of pain she's in. And it's, I don't know how you make pain this funny. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, I just have to say, uh, this is really a dream come true uh, to be talking with you because I, I just admire you and your work so very much. Um, so, so thank you so much. And thank you all uh, for joining us and, and, and thank you so much to Warwick's. Um, so I'm going to, uh, yeah, I'll just read from the opening. Um, so we, we start uh, with uh, Miranda Fitch, who is a theater professor at this New England college. And she, yeah, she's, she's, uh, she's very keen to stage um, all's well that ends well with her students, uh, but they're not having it. And she, uh, she is struggling with chronic pain. She's literally on the floor of her office before she's supposed to go down to rehearsal. So this is just a little taste. I'm lying on the floor watching against my will, a bad actress in a drug commercial tell me about her fake pain. Just because my pain is invisible, she pleads to the camera, doesn't mean it isn't real. And then she attempts a face of what I presume to be her invisible suffering. Her brow furrows as though she's about to take a difficult shit or else have a furious but forgettable orgasm. Her mouth is a thin grimace her dim eyes attempt to accuse something vague in the distance, a god perhaps. Her bloodless complexion is convincing, though they probably achieved this with makeup and lighting. You can do a lot with makeup and lighting, I have learned. I lie here on my back on the roughly carpeted floor with my legs in the air at a right angle from my body. My calves rest on my office chair seat, feet dangling over the edge. One hand on my heart, the other on my diaphragm, cigarette in my mouth. Snow blows onto my face from an open window above me that I'm unable to close. Lying like this will supposedly help decompress my spine and let the muscles in my right leg unclench. Help the fist behind my knee to go slack so that when I stand up, I'll be able to straighten my leg and not hobble around like Richard III. This is a position that, according to Mark, I can supposedly go into for relief, self-care, a time out from life. I think of Mark, Mark of the dry needles, Mark of the scraping silver tools, his handsome bro face, a wall of certainty framed by a crew cut, ever nodding at my various complaints as though they are all part of a grand upward journey that we are taking together, Mark and I. I lie like this and I do not feel relief. Left hip down to the knee, still on vague fire. A fist, a fist in my mid back that won't unclench. Right leg is concrete all the way to my foot, which even though it's in the air, is still screaming as if crushed by some terrible weight. I picture the leg of a chair pressing onto my foot, a chair being sat on by a very fat man. The fat man is a sadist. He is smiling at me. His smile says, I shall sit here forever, here with you on the third floor of this dubious college where you are dubiously employed. Theater studies, AKA one of two sad concrete rooms in the English department. Your office, I presume? Rather shabby. Downstairs in the sorry excuse for a theater, they're waiting for me. Where is Miss Fitch already? She should be here by now, shouldn't she? Rehearsals begin, well, now. Maybe she's sick or something. Maybe she's drunk or on drugs or something. Maybe she went insane. I picture them, my students, sitting on the stage, swinging long, pliant legs over the edge, young faces glowing with health as though they were spawned by the sun itself, waiting for my misshapen body to hobble through the double doors, quietly cursing my name as we speak about to declare mutiny any minute now. And that's it. Oh, 
you're it's so good I was muted because I'm howling with laughter during the whole thing. Um, so I, you know what I want to know about your writing of this book, which we have not talked about, is whether you started with the, the theater construct, the mutinous students. Where did you get your MFA? Uh, uh, I found. Um, whether it's the mutinous students, the pain, the theater, the MFA, which, which came first? Um, you know, I, it, it really did come from two places and I, uh, it came from experiencing chronic pain myself because I've, I've struggled with it for a number of years. I had a, a hip injury and had to have surgery and it was a really rough recovery. And during the recovery, I injured my back and then I ended up getting all these neurological symptoms down my legs. And it was just everything that I took for granted in my life became so challenging. I couldn't drive, I couldn't sit, uh, you know, I couldn't go grocery shopping, you know, I couldn't stand. Uh, it was, it was really, it was, it was a very um, frustrating and, and scary, um, you know, powerless kind of experience. And I, I really wanted to explore what it's like to live every day with this kind of pain. Um, that's, that's, ambiguous. You don't know if it's going to leave. You don't know exactly what its source is. Now there are so many things going on that it's hard to say um, what your what your path to healing is going to look like if, if you're ever going to heal. Um, so I was really interested in that. Plus people tell you it doesn't exist. It's invisible. It doesn't <laughs> exist. And you're crazy. I mean, you're as I love the opening where you're so dubious about this actress's pain, which is obviously like a kind of there are a lot of black mirrors in this book, just like with Jung, there are a lot of shadows. Um, must be what the, what Miss Fitch has heard, right? Yeah, that's right. That's one of the reasons why I made her an actress, I think, because I found that when I experienced pain, um, especially this kind of pain that's like, it's chronic and, and it's, it's neurological, um, I found myself having to perform it um, for doctors, for physical therapists, even for friends, just to get them to understand what I was going through, just to communicate it, because it kind of goes beyond language. It's so visceral that you find yourself performing it in order to communicate it. Um, but in the act of performing it, you are emphasizing it. And then you begin to second guess its reality. You know, you begin to second guess yourself. You don't trust yourself anymore because you've just performed it. Um, so because Miranda is an actress, you know, um, it's way more complicated for her, you know, because she's a performer by trade. Um, so, so I knew that, that the main character had to be an actor. Yeah. yeah. And you knew, and you had the chronic pain, I, I, just as somebody, I'm sober a long time and I've worked with so many women, really of so many young women who became drug addicts hundred percent based on the idiocy of their doctors who were simult simultaneously under treating and over medicating and under diagnosing and over prescribing um, so I have a lot of experience with women being told coming to me saying they're telling me I'm crazy and going to the emergency room for endometriosis or back pain or or some repetitive stress injury and been listened to these I once watched a doctor and I'd been waiting in the emergency room for a young woman for, for hours, for like four hours for him to arrive. And he just went in, started talking about what he had for lunch and was just going on and on. And I was sitting there and I was like, do you not understand she's in pain? You know, like I, and I became a crazy person. I was like the crazy friend, you know, in the hospital. Yeah, I mean, and 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 she's lucky that she had you and that you believed you believed her because that's that's the thing I think that's so hard is when you're when when you're in this experience it's so visceral it's so real, um, it's so um, you know compromising to your life, um, but people don't believe believe you, um, and then they ply you with the wrong thing like drugs, um, you know my main character is on benzos you know because they they. People think that she's just dealing with anxiety. anxiety. They think she's crazy. <laughs> yeah, they think she's crazy, and um, and so I was I was really interested in that too. Not just the language of pain, but just 
that helplessness that you can feel when you're you're experiencing this 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 reality but you've also lost the language because you're on drugs <laughs> you know to communicate it um so she's also dealing with that you know um and in the midst of this she gets this great idea that she's going to take one of the most complicated plays by Shakespeare and ram it down the throats of these little tattooed, miserable uh, goth baby. How can we describe them? They're not all goth. They're, it's a variety of young people, but but many are are themselves troubled. And, I, and you called it, I love that the, the word mutinous, you know, that there is a mutiny in the offing, that they're going to rise up and take over this play, right? Yeah, that's right. Um... I was I was really interested in that because you know the play that she's attached to is very unpopular and um, it's not it's not sexy you know um, it's not like Macbeth uh, but she's attached to it for her own reasons um, and so you know of course the students they want the sexy dark play they want Macbeth right they want um, murder and mayhem that's right that's right um, which you know in the end of course you kind of get a little taste of that and all as well. Um, but the, yeah, it's, it was really interesting to me, this idea that there was this uh, person who is living inside this tragedy, who desperately wants to stage this comedy, you know, the opposite of what she is living, everything that she wants to live, she's trying to put on the stage, the healing, the love story, um, the transformation, all of that. Uh, but what she has to live off stage is And just, recognition, that, that, right? That's right, right. Yeah. Recognition is is so important. I really think that she is seeking she is seeking that desperately because she is so alone. The book the book really does explore that. Like Bunny, it's it's interested in loneliness. And you said an interesting thing about the play. Uh, I was rereading the book yesterday while in between babysitting my granddaughter and left the book. So all I have is my um, my Kindle version, but. Um, that you described all's well as like the black mirror can you talk a little bit about how you've been informed by Jung and fairy tales and the, this idea of the light and the shadow side of story yeah absolutely um i i mean i love fairy tales and part of the reason why i was so drawn to all's well is because it is actually a fairy tale it's you know the clever enterprising wench who uh who turns the the world of this play upside down to get what she wants and 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 performs all this trickery she's you know she's kind of like a a, a jack um you know a fairy tale she's that kind of character um and so i i was really drawn to her because of that she's very mysterious um, and, and then the other component um, that interested me, the fairy tale aspect of All's Well, is that kind of careful what you wish for uh, story. Like you, you, Miranda has this, this, this wish to be healed and who can blame her? You know, she's literally on the floor of her office. Um, but I mean, what happens when you, when you get what you wish for? What's the cost? And, and that's what I'm interested in. And that's what fairy tale is deeply interested in too is, the cost, cost of getting what you wish for, the cost of transformation. And that's what Macbeth also deals with, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's the crossover, you know, is uh, that that's that's where that's exactly um, where I saw the connection between Helen and Macbeth is that they both have this dream um, that can't be realized within the world of the play. Um, and magic has to happen and 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 a dark act, you know, um, in order to make it so. And then there's a price to pay, you know, you in, know both in both. Cases. And so Miranda, I don't know how much I can give away. There's so much I want to give away. For those of you, I, I, I think the, uh, you know, the wonderful thing about, about Marquez's comment about magic realism was, you know, th this isn't surreal. Some, they, Someone was asking about him about his surrealism, and he said, "There's nothing surreal here. That's how life is in Latin America." And um, uh, that instead of of uh, Macbeth's three witches, you get three business guys, right? This this these three magical entities, her benefactors, quote unquote, who are supposed to help her. Uh, remove this pain. Mm -hmm. Can I tell them what happens or no? Should I? I'll ruin it for yeah, everybody. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Well, so, I think it's right at the, right at the, 
happens yeah, early yeah. enough, but that, that she can magically kind of dole out her pain. I mean, think of, aren't we all, you know, don't we all want to dole out our pain to, to uh-oh. Uh, uh-oh. I think Mary's, I think Mary's gone. gone. I'm Julie, not gone. Are you still, are you still there? there? I'm not gone. I'm here. I'm here too. I'm here too. I'm, I'm here. Is Mona, Mona, Mona might have. Mona Mona's gone. Mona's gone. Mona's gone. Mona's gone to the dark side. <laughs> okay, she's a, she, okay. Julie, if you go off, I will keep talking. She will log off and log back on. Okay. Okay. Maybe. Sounds good. Sounds good. Maybe. Question Maybe. mark. Um. Uh, I'm assuming Mona's logging off and logging back on. Um, but these, she's able to kind of dole out her pain in the book um, to these horrible students who are refusing to do the, the playwright. Um, and it's, uh, but there's a cost. I mean, isn't that what we all want to do in some way? Isn't that the perfect revenge to be able to give whatever pain uh, we want to get rid of? And so in some ways, you, you know, this looks like a solution. She gets rid of her pain. Uh, but as she says, as in every fairy tale, there's uh, there's a price to pay. Um, and it's so much like this idea from Jung that, uh, you know, we each have a shadow self for every, every drama. Go ahead. Whew. Okay. I don't know so what happened. I was asking you to talk a little bit about um, that notion of, that Jungian notion, because I see it in all your work about the, sh the dark side, the shadow self, the combination of magic that is very grounded in psychological need um, and very real. I just want to say the magic isn't like, uh, you know, teen witches. It's more, um, it's, it's more believable than that. I mean, I'm completely buy into this. Yeah, I think it comes from, you know, it really does come from the, from, well, from the Shakespeare too, you know, the witches. Um, we were talking about the witches before. Um, and the witches are so interesting to me because they just, they sort of suggest, you know, they just say, well, you know, you will be king, you know. Um, they sort of plant, they plant a seed, basically. Um, and then the question of, you know, whether or not Macbeth is going to go for it, whether or not he's aided um, in this in this task, it's unclear. It's unclear, um, and that's kind of the the sort of energy that I was interested in too. Um, there's definitely magic going on. I'm the, I, I would argue that Macbeth is a supernatural play because it does have the witches, of course. Um, but the degree to which um, Miranda is exercising free will, to what degree is she monstrous? Um, to what degree does she have agency is something I'm really interested in because her desire comes from a really human place. We can all empathize with the desire to be free from pain. That's where the psychological reality comes in. Um, but the wish fulfillment, um, you know, I, I, that's the thing about fairy tale that I love. That's why they always ring true for me. Um, is, is in the fact that they, they always explore the, the fallout of the wish, you know, um, the cost. The cost. And, and you mentioned in your Paris Review interview an article that, I, that I've yet to read called Cute Slash Monstrous, is that, what's the name of it? Yeah, the monstrous cute, uh, which uh, was, yeah, so, so I, I forget the, the, uh, the name of the writer. Um, I, I'll have I'll to have look to look. Here, here. It's uh, it's Maja Brzezowski. I'll put it in the chat. Oh, uh, oh great, great. Yeah, yeah it's, it's fascinating. fascinating. Because, you know, it's it's sort of what inspired the bunnies. Really, it was just that idea of you know the way that we're seduced by beautiful things, the way that we're seduced by cute things. You know, I mean, certainly I am. I'm I'm rendered powerless in front of cute things. I always joke that like if a corgi ran for president, I would probably vote for the corgi, even if the corgi was a fascist, you know, uh, because I can't help it. Um, and, and, and beauty can have the same, can cast the same kind of spell. It's a very, it can be a very dark spell. And so I, so I am, I am really, really interested in that. And, and, and with Miranda, it was very fun because, 
yeah, she is the heroine of her story, but she's also the villain. And that's the case with Helen too. She's slightly villainous. She's slightly crafty. I mean, you can't, she's a very polarizing heroine. Did you have theater experience? I always wondered. I had no idea if you did. Yeah, um, in high school, uh, I, uh, I, was, I, was, I was in plays and loved it and did some writing too. That's actually really how I fell in love with writing, uh, was writing dialogue, writing skits. I used to do it as a kid to entertain myself and then I did it all the time as a teen. Um, and then, uh, and then kind of fell in love with poetry and didn't, didn't come back to writing dialogue until I started exploring fiction. But, but, but the energy um, between two people, the momentum of an exchange, that, that is what used to excite me the most um, about storytelling. I could tell a story with, with just two people talking. Um, it would always surprise me where it would go if I just really stayed in the moment. Um, yeah, so, so I love- I love, I love yeah. Um, and how do you feel? I felt like this book, I mean, I've loved all three books, but I felt like this book was, was there something that drove you to what I feel is, I just feel like this is a breakout breakthrough book. I think this is going to be a very big book for you and for, for readers in the country. I do. I predict good, great things for it. Was there something about the writing of it or that precipitated the writing of it that you think might have given it a special, that special tenderness, hilarity, horror that you're known for really? Um, you know, I think, I think it came from a very like kind of dark real place inside of me. I mean, I, I really uh, went through a period of real fear um, when I was dealing with this injury and then the recovery that just never seemed to, to end. In fact, I'm still, I'm still dealing with with uh, with chronic pain, I'll probably deal with it forever. Just just uh, like so many people, um, and uh, and I wanted, I really wanted to explore that. And then and when I was in pain, um, when I was going through the surgery, actually, um, I was writing my uh, my comprehensive exams. Um, I was doing my PhD um, in English and creative writing, and I had chosen Shakespeare as my major figure. So I was reading the plays. And I just fell so deeply in love with the plays. I, ha I had so much gratitude. gratitude. And this was at Brown? Uh, no, this, no was, this was, this was this at, was at, at, at uh, Denver University, yeah. Um, I was doing my PhD there. And, uh, and so, yeah, I just fell, I fell totally in love with the plays and they gave me so much solace. And I just loved those reversals of fortune um, that in, in the plays, they were so exciting to me. Um, especially given where I was, you know, I was in such a uh, hopeless, sad state. So the, the, the magic of all's well um, really spoke to me. And so that's all, I think that's all in there in the book. I mean, the, the, the cool thing um, that happened uh, with this book, and it doesn't always happen, um, is that the voice really uh, came to me um, very organically. Like it was, it, once it got going, um, the, the story kind of unfolded pretty, um, pretty organically, which was surprising. I thought I was gonna get really messed up dealing with two plays, um, but, but it was, they, they spoke to each other. They have like a symbiotic relationship. So it worked out. Yeah. And who were, I know you were reading George Saunders among, among other people. We, we also, you guys, we all te we both teach with George, the great uh, short story writer and, and now novelist. Uh, George Saunders, um, Booker Prize winner, big dang deal, every way he can be. Who else? Who else were you reading that that gave you permission, or or maybe have you read? I, I that gave the work that energy, or gave you? I would be terrified. I mean, yeah. I, it's it's work I so much admire, but I'm so doomed to reality. I just have no mind for the ma this magic. Yeah, it's it's um I was terrified too. Like I, I really was. I was I was intimidated by the Shakespeare. I'm not a scholar, you know. Um I, I was coming at it from the perspective of a of a just a creative writer. Um and uh and yeah, I was intimidated by the by the plays too and by the magic. Um but I was drawn I was drawn to it because of that, I guess. And I mean Atwood, um, you know, Hagseed. Uh, is such a brilliant adaptation of the Tempest. Tempest. 
I don't even, how do I not know this book? Tell me what it's called. Oh, it's, oh, it's, it's called, called Agsy. Agsy. Is yeah. it a novel or a short story? It's a novel. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's her adaptation of The Tempest. Um, and it's, it's so good. It's so dreamy and, and funny and, and complex. It's, it's, and mysterious. It's just beautiful. It's so beautiful. Um, so certainly that one. Um, and then funny, funny enough, it wasn't, it wasn't, a, it was a kind of an immersive theater experience. Um, Sleep No More in New York. New York. Yeah. yeah. I was there. I saw that. Oh, you did? Oh, you did? Yes, I did. Uh, t you guys, I mean, if you didn't get to see it, it's this house that you kind of walk into and each room, you kind of move from room to room and it's very spooky. It's like being in a haunted house. There are these bizarre scenes being played out that are frightening and, you're try and your mind is trying to make sense or a story. But meanwhile, people are just milling from room to room. Is that a good way to describe it? Oh yeah, that's, oh yeah, that's. I mean, I, that's that was exactly right. And you're yeah, you're masked and you can't say anything. You have to be quiet. Um, and yeah, I just followed different actors and got drawn into different scenes. And when I was going through the the you know immersive theater experience, I was in pain. So <laughs> I was just kind of hobbling through it. Um, so absolutely, that experience um, inspired uh, the book. Uh, and, and Miranda's experience um, off stage and on um, of the plays. So that was, that was fantastic. I, I love that production so much. I love the immersive quality of it. And I was really trying to bring that into the book, just that, that immersive visceral quality. quality. Um, I, I have to ask you what you're working on, but I'm so sorry to do it. I can't believe this book didn't take everything from you. If I, if I had written this book, I would just be, waiting for the parade to start. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm working uh, on uh, another novel. Um, uh, I, it's about um, the beauty industry. It's about a beauty uh, cult that this woman gets drawn into. Ooh, are there shades of goop in there? <laughs> it, it, it has some, has some fun with that, with that whole. Um, Do you know, I know I know people involved in that goop thing out in LA who were like sex, all sexually assaulted by this crazy vaginal doctor. One of those vaginal massage doctors, like the guy who, you know, interfered with Simone Biles. Uh, mm -hmm. Those, those, I mean, some of those wellness cults are like less than well. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, yes. For sure, it, it 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 definitely paints that whole world in very dark shades, but enchanting shades too, because it's 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 pretty irresistible if it's framed in the right light. Um, the beauty world that is. Um, and and yeah, is yeah. did you feel did you do a lot of rewriting of this? You, you you said the story evolved from the voice very organically. Did you find yourself? Was it structured as it's structured now? Um, yes, it is. Uh, the, the, the only, um, the, the part where I got scared, <laughs> was, uh, definitely towards the end. Cause I had these two plays, you know, one is a comedy and one is this like really dark tragedy. Um, so how was I, how was I going to end this book that is, is dealing with these two plays, one on stage, one off stage. I had to find this like happy, um, space that could accommodate them both, you know, all's well as a problem play. So it kind of gave me that permission. It has tragic and comic elements in it. So, so, so that was, that was the scary part. Um, you know, would I, would I go down the road of Macbeth or would I go down the road of all's well? Um, and I, I, the reader will see, but it was, it, yeah, it, it, it kind of, that, that did, that did, that did, did it's a crash course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. a crash course <laughs> in, uh, in those two worlds. I'm afraid, I don't know where Julie is, but I'm, I bet people have a million questions and I don't want to hog all our time here. Oh yes, I'm ready for Q and A yeah, yeah. From, from the audience. So you guys, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna be fed your questions right now and sort of parse through them for Mona. Um, I am ready for Q and A, Julie. Uh, oh, so. Oh hand woohoo 
Have you met Dimna yet? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I really like the fact that retribution is, uh, Dimna Callahan, for those of you who don't know, is a world-class Shakespeare scholar and a lover of poetry and, and Shakespeare and everything. I really like the fact that retribution is turned upside down in this book. There's a genre inversion as it becomes comic. Could Mona talk about how this tragic dynamic became a source of comedy for her? Yeah, how do you as a, as a writer move from the tragic to the comic? Well, I'm a very melodramatic person, you know, so I, I um, and then I quickly have to laugh at my own melodrama, I can't help it. Um, so, you know, uh, there's just it's 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 an impulse that I've I've just always had. Um, even even if the the feelings that I'm experiencing, the dark feelings, they come from a very real, genuine place. Uh, there's always like a small part of me, either later on or in the moment, that that can't help but laugh. Um, so I use that, you know. And I, I don't know if it's if it's a coping mechanism for me. I I, I don't know why why I move to humor. Um, when I'm really sad or really scared. Um, but it always feels like it's true. Like the comedy is part of the truth. The, 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 the impulse to kind of laugh is, is part of it. It's part of the experience. Um, it's what makes it ring true. So, that, so that's how. It's just that, that tendency that I think I have. And, and I think it's, it's there in the plays too, you know? Um, so I loved um, drawing, drawing from that. Um, uh, there's a wonderful question from Ben Ramke. Shared pain is also intense intimacy. I assume that's Ben Ramke, the poet, because how many people are named Ben Ramke? Uh, but shared pain is also intense intimacy. Is it, Mona? Yeah, yeah. I, I do. It is. Um, um, you know, part part of the reason why I think uh, the 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 book begins um, the way that it does in this place of such isolation is because there is nobody um, with whom Miranda can share her pain. She is really alone. And when she tries to share it, it's, it's like it gets kind of pushed back, you know? Um, it gets denied or, or dismissed or diminished. And then she's totally isolated. She can't share it. Um, and so-, and so I think that's part of why she's drawn to her student Ellie so much. Um, she has this student that's kind of her pet that she's obsessed with. Um, and it's inexplicable, you know, um, to others why she has this obsession with this girl. Um, but I think the reason that she does is because Ellie is also kind of a lonely uh, soul who is like broken and she can see that. And maybe they have a bit of shared pain. Um, and so there is an intimacy between them. Um, and, and, that, and that, so that's a great, that's a great question. I think that that's, that's a great that's... question from Jen Targ, uh, from Mona. Have you ever read Otessa Moshfe and Claire Louise Bennett? Cause you kind of write the same, which is awesome. I would disagree, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, I haven't read Claire Louise Bennett. I've, I've heard of her and I've seen, I've seen her books. I think Pond is one of them and it's been recommended to me. Um, so I will for sure check her out. I, I have read uh, Otessa Moshfeg. I did an event with her uh, for her book, um, Death in Her Hands, just just last month. And it was phenomenal. I love love her work so much. Love her sensibility. I love, I love her uh, voices. Uh, that, that is the thing about her work that excites me the most. Well, she has that thing Delillo has, um, yeah, which yeah. is she's just a consummate stylist. Um, I feel like I almost, I, I sometimes, it's a terrible thing to say for a young writer I admire, but she doesn't need, she doesn't care what I think of her. But um, I often feel there's less at stake. There, it seems like there's gonna be a lot at stake, but I often feel that the, the, there's an edge to it that I think blocks, there's, I, I don't know, I'm, uh, I, I have a lot of strain myself, and so I'm drawn to writers who show a lot of strain, who are less cool than Moshfe. Um, is that oh, how we? Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, please, you. Oh, oh was, your your writing is just. I, part of why I love it is just that it's so fearless. That's why I'm so drawn to it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm terrified all the time. <laughs> there's a there's a as anyone who knows me can see. I'm just live in a state of constant 
t that's actually not true. Uh, it it used to be more that way. When I was your age, I was terrified all the time, and then I'm just not. Um, was all's well always the working title? Oh yes, um, and that that is a great question, and and that was a guiding light um, because of the two plays. I had to remember, and it was my mantra: all's well. You know, you it's, know, it's dark, dark. A phrase all's well that ends well. Um, I've said this before, but it's it's really true. I always pictured whenever I would read, when I read the play, because I had such a visceral, a visceral reaction to that play. Like I have notes all through it, calling Helen a liar and like so manipulative. And it's just, I had, I really despised Helen. I don't, I don't know. Um, but but all, all not a of, fan of her. No, I'm the, I felt the same way. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, she's, she's not right. quite Odysseus, right? right. <laughs> but some some of those, some of that cunning. But yes, yeah, yes. There, but yeah, but yeah. she was too bulletproof for me. Yeah. yeah, yeah, she she gets through kind of unscathed, which is why I kind of wanted to give her a little Macbeth, you know, like some 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 edges and some cost to like wanting this w turning like I said the whole world of that play upside down just for this one guy it just seems so crazy but but yeah and I also have on the other hand I have empathy for her because she's an orphan she's powerless so so I was really but my first reaction was just this, like couldn't stand her and all's well that ends well just seems like the sort of phrase that you know uh, uh, like you would tell yourself in order to justify something terrible, you know? Um, and so the, I really wanted to have fun with that in this book. Um, I just, I, I so love wonder, it's a gorgeous title. Um, one more from Ian Glenn Nichols. Of your, okay. three, of your three protagonists, Lizzie, Samantha, and Miranda, Miranda is the teacher, which was the hardest to find distance from? That's a really interesting question. Can you explain to them, again, Miranda is the teacher, the sufferer of pain putting on the play, and then there's Lizzie and Samantha. Yes. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, Lizzie is the is the heroine of um, 13 Ways of Looking at a Fat Girl. So she's a character who struggles with body image and Sam is the heroine of Bunny, um, and she's kind of like an outsider, um, you know, an uh, outsider MFA student who uh, is in the same cohort as a group of girls that she calls the Bunnies, and they call each other Bunny, and they hate her, and she hates them. Um, and Miranda, yeah, she is this uh, theater professor suffering from pain, which was the hardest to find distance from. I get really attached, um, but at the same time, uh, they have to be distant um, for me to to write them at all uh, with any kind of real uh, belief um, from me. <laughs> um, you know, like I, I need to believe in them. And in order to believe in them, they have to become really separate. Um, so it's kind of, it, it's a weird paradox because I'm so attached to them and yet they, they really are their own entities apart from me in order to, to, to put them on the page. Um, I think, I guess maybe, Maybe Lizzie, because it was my first. Yeah, that was probably the hardest. Okay, I think Julie is popping back on. Thank you guys so much for joining us. This was, I, was such, such, oops. I urge you guys to buy um, All's Well, and uh, it wouldn't hurt to read Bunny and 13 Ways of Looking at a Fat Girl, but uh, Mona Awad, thank you so much for, for uh, having this conversation with me i'm such a fan thank you so much mary it was like a dream come true and warwick's too thank you so much i was gonna bring it back around just real quickly and to end it um can you tell people where you wrote we we're gonna bring it back oh. to la jolla because i think for those that are watching from around here um because i i used to see mona around the store because there was a little bit of writing that occurred so what, what you took up some time off or something what what happened with the la jolla connection yeah, um, so I came, I came to uh, La Jolla um, to write uh, for, for a stretch. Um, and uh, it, was, it was where I actually finished a draft of the book. So I wrote, I wrote the book over the stretch of, a, of about a month um, in La Jolla, the first draft. Wow. And, um, and I would go to Warwick's 
all the time. And, uh, and Julie was so wonderful. She would always have um, book recommendations, uh, things to keep me company and keep me inspired. It was just such a fantastic community. So I'm, I'm especially, this is like a dream come true. Be in conversation with Mary Carr, be hosted by Warwick's. Um, I just, yeah. Well, I, as Mary, as Mary stated, I agree with you wholeheartedly, Mary, that I think this is the rising, this is the shooting star that we're going to see um, coming from this book here, here because yeah, it is absolutely, absolutely fantastic. fantastic. Mazel tov, as Jesus said. <laughs> <laughs> Happy publication day. Yes. Yes. So, so excited, excited for you. This is such a great, book. I, I can't stress enough that we love it at the store. I just, everybody just needs to grab a copy of this book. It's so it's so good on so many different levels. So Mary, thank you for your time. Appreciate it very much. Sorry that we had a little bit of technical difficulties, everybody, but we made it through and it was a great conversation. Mona, love you. Can't wait to see you in La Jolla again. Um, and with that, I'm gonna say good night to everybody. Bye. Bye. Love you both. Thank you all. <laughs>